I'm Josh Holly. Uh, my wife and I have been going to New Life for a year and a half, um, and this is my story. I'm originally from Cleveland, Tennessee, um, born to three generations of Pentecostal ministers. And my family was a Southern Gospel Quartet growing up. Um, it's the ideal image of what a Christian family should look like. Um, but what people weren't aware of um, was that there was abuse happening in my childhood. Um, from the time I was five until I was 13. When you have trauma and you stack a lot of things on top of it, of grandfather committing suicide, friends passing away, and for no fault of anyone else's, you don't feel a safe space to be able to deal with those traumas, deal with those faults. My answer was drugs. So I, uh, that's what I committed my life to. Um, and I put on an excellent front. I would go back and forth between playing in bands and uh, festivals and clubs and bars to I, I would get saved and turn my life around and I would immediately start playing for some ministry or some church. But I never dealt with me. I, I never dealt with my stuff. And as long as I looked like a typical Christian, then I must be okay. Um, in 2010, I went, end of 2010, I went to rehab for the first time um, in Thorsby, Alabama. <laughs> It turning point and somebody saw through all of my facades thought saw through all of my characters that I had developed and they called me out on what my real pain was and for the next eight years my life was horrible um, I got married to a very abusive woman who put me in the hospital more than once I got a divorce I missed my second son being born because I didn't know where his mom was. And I went in and out of treatment centers, in and out of institutions, all the time just like crying out in pain. And then I found myself in a position that I thought I'd never be in, where I was legitimately losing my mind. And I'd come back and forth to Thorsby, Alabama for rehab three times now. And I told my parents, uh, one more time. Let me go one more time. I said, I'm, I'm putting it all on the table. I'm not holding anything back. And they, they rolled the dice on me one more time. And so in May 25th of 2018, I walked onto the property at Turning Point in Thorsby one more time. But this time when somebody said, so where are you gonna go when you graduate? My answer was, I don't know. <laughs> Well, what are you going to do about this? I don't know. And they kept asking me my plan, what my purpose was, what my direction was. And I was finally at a point where I just said, I don't know. So I committed to do it all. Anything anybody asked of me. Some people told me that the way I would stay sober was in the rooms of recovery. And so I went all in. A local pastor told me that I needed to reignite my love of Jesus. So I went all in. And life started to change. I started to find a peace. That the, the Bible says that 
He gives us a peace that passes understanding. Because all my life, I just wanted to know why. We all just want to know why. But he gives us peace that passes knowing why. And so a month left at Turning Point before I graduated, a local pastor asked me if I would help play uh, in his worship band uh, while I was still in rehab. And I did. And I began to befriend an incredible woman. And the first night we talked and talked about music, talked about all kinds of stuff. And when I got back to Turning Point, I sat in my, in my room with my roommate and I said, dude, this is not happening. I can't stand women. I've been abused, I've been lied to, I've been cheated on. I, I can't do this. And uh, he looked at me and he said, dude, you never know what God has in store. And he said, so what are you gonna do? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> And so it came to my last week at Turning Point. And I'd been saying, I don't know, for 75 to 80 days. <laughs> and all of a sudden, three days before I graduated, they came to me and said, Josh, do you have any plans? And I said, no, <laughs> I've, I've got nothing. It's all up to God now. I, I'm refusing to make plans anymore. And they said, we'd like to offer you a position as the transportation coordinator um, at our halfway house. We can't pay you anything, but we'll cover your room and board for free. And so that was my next step. And I lived there for a little over a month. In that time, me and my now wife, Tiffany, started dating. Um, and I was terrified because what if this is like the one area that God doesn't show up in? He took care of my food. He took care of my finances. He gave me a roof over my head from literally homelessness. But what if relationships are like the one thing that God doesn't touch? That's all on you. but I found the most incredible woman I could ever ask for. Who had dealt with her own trauma and her own pain. And she was rolling the dice again. See, it says that it's instilled under every man the same measure of faith. And so it's like this crazy poker game where we take our last little bit of faith you know we can be super churchy and call it a mustard seed <laughs> and we put it in and we say I'm all in and God calls and we win <laughs> and now all of a sudden I've got a little more faith see my first faith was I've already been to turning point three times and I'm still broken But I said one more time and I went all in and God showed up. And I said, I have nowhere to go when I graduate, God. Like I went all in and I'm just gonna go back to being homeless. But I went all in and God showed up and I said, I'll never love again. I can't put my heart through that. But I went all in and God showed up. So we get married in this little small wedding of like 12 chairs on the side of Lake Mitchell. <laughs> and uh, we've been married a little over a week. And I don't know where I'm gonna get a job. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I don't, 
fit into the typical fabric of rural Alabama. <laughs> and I'm dropping the kids off at work, Tiff, or the kids off at school, Tiffany off at work, and then taking our one car, her car, because I showed up with a suitcase and a backpack and that's still all I have. And about a week after we were married, two weeks after we were married, I get a call from an insurance company that while I was driving for the halfway house, I had been T-boned. And they said, Mr. Holly, we've been trying to get a hold of you. We just wanted to ask you a couple more questions about the accident. One of the questions they asked was, with your injuries, how much pay did you give up? When I tell people that, they, they're, the wheels get turning. <laughs> but I told them, I said, I'll be honest with you. I was working for room and board. I, I didn't miss any pay. She said, Mr. Holly, we've never had somebody be so honest with us. Would it be okay if we overnighted your family a check for $3,500? See, the last night before I got on the Greyhound to come to Turning Point, my mom, who is an incredible woman of God, looked at me and she said, Josh, if you could paint your picture, what would it look like? And I said, I would live in the country in a beautiful single wide trailer. I'd be married to a woman who accepts all parts of me. A little hippie, a little hood, and passionate about Jesus. I would have a Jeep. And I would make sure nobody ever feels like me again. So I got that check from the insurance company. And after my tags and title, my Jeep Grand Cherokee cost me $3,400. So I got a job as a photographer working for Life Touch. It was awesome. I was traveling all over the state, meeting people, having fun getting paid overtime. <laughs> and I was so proud because my image was, I'm providing, I'm a provider, like I'm a part of normal society now. And God called us to leave the church that we were at and we came to visit New Life. And Robert was preaching that Sunday and he preached about Elijah and the prophets of Baal and how, what is that? They had to give up four barrels of water. What is that one thing that you're not willing to give up? And he even said, I'm not telling you to go quit your job. And we got in the car and Tiffany said, Josh, what's your one thing, babe? And I said, you, you ain't gonna like it. I'm turning in my two weeks notice tomorrow. She said, where are you going? And I said, I'm gonna drive to Turning Point. And I'm gonna tell them that if they want me to clean toilets, if they want me to mow the grass, whatever they want me to do when this job's over, Monday through Friday, I'm coming to serve. And they said, we've been waiting for you to take a step of faith. We'd like to offer you a full-time position. In January, they made me the program coordinator for the entire facility. Which meant I got an office. <laughs> and I hung up all my pictures 
of all four of my beautiful kids. And I hung up my Grateful Dead picture of Jerry Garcia. <laughs> and I sat in my office chair. And I bawled my eyes out. <laughs> because I have a beautiful home out in the country. I was gifted my dream car. God gave me a woman that I didn't know existed. And I spend every day listening to a man sit across the table from me and say, I swore I'd never tell anybody this. My whole life in church, I grew up in Pentecostal charismatic churches and I would hear them do the whole call and response of God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. But sitting at my desk, I realized we can't cheapen it. He's so good. He's just so good. See, if I wouldn't have taken my mustard seed of faith and said one more time, I never would have had the faith to love again. I never would have had the faith to quit my job. I never would have had the faith to tell my story. How beautiful is faith? Think about the picture of having a willingness to go all in. All in. Not just all in with the Lord, but the people that were around Josh that said, I'm going all in on you also. And I'm trusting the Lord to do a work in you. We haven't seen it done yet, but we're believing. We're holding on to promises. And that's the essence of faith. Josh, thanks so much, man. Thank you so much. Man, I'm just, uh, th those are the kinds of things that when, you, when you're struggling your own faith, that give you the sense that, no, God's not done yet. If he did it in him, he can do it in me. And we have throughout the scriptures testimonies of faith to say, if he can do it in them, he can do it in me. And this morning as we continue just thinking about faith, I want us to kind of hold on to the redemption that we see in the story of Josh that we heard this morning, and also I want us to look at a, a picture of a group of people that are preparing to receive the promise, to receive the promise. You see, Abraham was made a promise back in the day. It's found in Genesis chapter 12, verses 5 through, through 7. This is what it says. It says, when they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. So we have a promise. And we find out in the story that Abraham believed the promise. He believed the promise. And when Abraham believed the promise, something amazing happened. It says that when he believed the promise of God, it was counted to him as righteousness. That his faith initiated righteousness in his own heart. And in some measure, Abraham initiated a whole people that would be born according to that same faith. By, by some glorious mystery of God, you and I, by faith, are present in the seat of Abraham when he believes the promise of God. We're present in that moment because in some measure, he is our father by faith. And so Abraham believes the promise of God, and he met the promise with faith. 
And now Israel is about to realize the fulfillment of the promise, and they're also called to receive the promise by faith. It wasn't just the reception of the promise by faith. It was also the receiving of the fulfillment of the promise by faith. And so they come to the land. They stand on the precipice of entering into the fulfillment of what God had promised. And they're looking at the land, and they start to say to Moses, let us go in and spy it out. And so the Lord says to Moses, okay, you can allow them to do that. But a lot of time has passed since the promise was made. We talked last week about the promise being made to Abram of a child, and it's 25 years from the moment of the promise to the fulfillment of the promise. Well, the promise made to Abraham was over 400 years ago for this land. And I don't know about you, but as the series of time passes, when the Lord makes us a promise individually, we begin to cling to that promise. And as time passes, we have a tendency as humans to forget about the promise. Or we begin to think, maybe the Lord needs my help in seeing it accomplished. And he doesn't. When, when we begin to help the Lord, we get Ishmael's, right? And the Lord is saying, I don't want you to have an Ishmael. There's a child of promise to be born in your household, and that's what I want to see coming, because blessing comes through the promise. And the people of Israel are standing on the banks of the river in preparation for that, and they say, let us send out spies. And so in Numbers 13, this is what we begin to read. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a chief among them. So Moses sent from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the people of Israel. And guess what they discovered when they arrived in the land? They discovered a land of abundant blessing. That They discovered in one place a cluster of grapes that took two men to carry out of the property. It was such a significant find, they end up naming the valley the Valley of the Cluster. (laughs) They say this is a land flowing with milk and honey, but there are giants in the land. And here's the kicker for us. By faith, we have to hold on to the promise in the midst of seeing the problems. We have to hold on to the promise in the midst of seeing the problems. It's the only way that we're actually able to go all in. Josh didn't mention it this morning, but I'm willing to bet that his mom, who believed in him, had a promise from the Lord over his life. Is that true? (laughs) Yeah. You see, that gives a person the faith to continue believing when they see mounting evidence to the contrary. Every step of faith has mounting evidence to the contrary of the promise of God. Every single step. Because every word that the Lord says to us has to be tested by what we see around us. That's the only way that faith can grow and we can learn to persevere in the midst of trial is for there to be a promise, but mounting evidence to the contrary of the promise. So that when we go in to spy out the land, we're looking for a way to enter into the promise, not wondering whether or not God can overcome what we see. And we always have to hold to the promise in the midst of seeing the problems. It's the way that the Lord intended. But see, when Israel began to enter the land, they didn't begin to see the promise. They began to see the problems. And their mind began to focus on the fact that there's giants in the land. And they're way bigger than us. And they're the offspring of giants in the past, which was this mating of angels and women that produced this race of giants that the Scripture called Nephilim. That's in Genesis chapter 6. You can look at it later. But... We see that as they enter the land, they lost sight of the promise that was made over 400 years ago that you're going to inhabit this property. And all that they could begin to see when they got into the land was the problem. And I want to tell you this morning that as you navigate the promise of God in your life, you're going to notice problems. And we have to keep the proper perspective because if we begin to shift our focus toward the problems, we begin to misrepresent The purpose of the spying out of the land. See, God said, you go look at it so that you can know which way to enter into the promise. Because the promise is done. It's accomplished. The land is already yours. And you begin to see the problems in the land as avenues by which the Lord is going to work to accomplish his promise. But when you go into the land and all you see are the problems, your mentality begins to shift. 
And you begin to focus on those problems, and it's all that you can begin to see, and you lose sight of the promise. And when you lose sight of the promise, faith, little by little, is diminished in your heart. And the thing about the voice of the Lord is, and the promise, the Lord speaks very clearly, initially. But when you begin to focus on the problems, the voice of the Lord begins to become quieter and quieter and quieter until the moment that it's barely a whisper and you can hardly hear it at all. That's why it's so important, church. It's so important that in the moment that the Lord speaks, we find some way to hold on to the purity of what he said because oftentimes after the Lord speaks, our mind begins to take and twist and turn around what we think that the Lord said instead of what he actually said. And we begin to experience the the, the evidence to the contrary of the promise. And those things begin to diminish the promise. They begin to diminish the voice of the Lord in our life. And we have to go back and hold on to the promise because we have to view the problems through the filter of the promise. And that is what gives us faith to continue in the promise, to continue in faith. And the people of Israel couldn't focus on the grapes, the cluster of grapes. They focused it on the giants. And here's the second problem. Giants in the land always appear larger than the blessing of the promise. Giants in the land always appear larger than the blessing of the promise. Look at what we read in Numbers 13, just a little down the chapter. It says, and they told him, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. They have two men standing before the congregation with a cluster of grapes that they pulled out of the valley of the cluster. A a, a cluster of grapes so heavy, two men are having to carry. They said, this is what's in the land. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Down just a few verses, it says, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim, and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. So we seemed to them. You know, it's one thing if you think somebody's big and, they, and you think you're small, it's another thing when... You think they're big, and they also think you're small. (laughs) They're looking at the testimony of what God has prepared for them in the land. It stands in front of their eyes, but they cannot see the blessing that will come from the land. All that they can set their mind on listening to is that there are giants there also. The, The blessing of the promise looks smaller to them than the threat of the giant. And I want to tell you that as you pursue, as we as a body pursue to walk with the Lord, there are days ahead of us and there are decisions ahead of us as a body of believers because there are some large decisions that stand before us as a people. We have to, at every moment, cling to the promises that the Lord is making to us. We have to hold on to what the Lord is saying. And some of the things that the Lord is saying is that He is with us. He will go before us. He has a place prepared for us. And we have to look at the giants that will begin to pop up in front of us through the lens of the blessing of the promise. We have to begin to focus in on and hold in on the promise so that when we see the giants in the land, we're not convinced that we can't overtake them. Because the promise The blessing of the promise is greater than the giants of the land. And until we have a heart and a mind to focus on the blessing of the promise, we will miss out on the blessing that's available to us through what Christ has promised to this body of believers. We cannot see the giants. We have to see the blessing of the promise. You see, when you're in the midst of the sea and the storm comes up, it's easy to get fixated on the storm, but we have to Maintain the promise of faith that says, no, we're going to the other side. You see, the disciples, when they're in the midst of the boat and the storm's on the sea, they cannot remember that Jesus said, we're going to get in the boat and go over to the other side of the seashore. But if they had clung to the promise, that's why when Jesus calms the storm, he says, why why do you have such little faith? I told you we're going to the other side 
of the lake, why now when the storm comes do you doubt? Why now do you doubt when you see the storm? Hold on to the blessing of the promise because it gives us the filter through which we get to see the inhabitants of the land. Caleb had a different perspective. Caleb and Joshua, the two of the 12 that came back, had a different perspective because in the midst of spying out the land, what they saw was the promise of God. They're going through the hill country and they're seeing the beauty of the timber and they're seeing the beauty of the land and they're seeing Jericho and they're going, man, look at this huge walled city in this land that God's given to us. And look at the milk and honey and look at this cluster of grapes. And when the whole congregation begins to bring a bad testimony, this is what the scriptures say that Caleb did <clears throat> in Numbers 13, 30. It says, but Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it. <laughs> For we are well able to overcome it. We are well able. Let's not even hesitate. Let's not deliberate. Let's not consider this report. Let's, let's, let's grab our swords right now and go up and occupy it because we're well able to overcome it. And the glory of what Caleb is saying is not that we're going to do this by our might or by Joshua's military prowess. He's saying something different. He's saying, look, God has made us a promise. The land is already ours. And by faith, these giants are nothing but obstacles for us to overcome. They're obstacles for us to overcome because by faith, obstacles are nothing more than opportunities to overcome. Obstacles are opportunities for us to overcome when we walk by faith. Why is Caleb able in the midst of such a bad report to speak with such conviction and such faith to the people of Israel? Because he knows the promise. And the promise of God is like a set of glasses that you put on that allows us to begin to see everything in a different light because so much of what we experience is according to our perspective. The way that we process life, it's amazing. You can take two people, watch the same event, and one is positive about it and one's negative about it. And what's the difference? Often it's a matter of perspective. It's, it's the lens through which they're watching life unfold, that they process the events that they're watching through. And you can look at a giant in the land and go, no, I'm out. Because I look like a grasshopper to them and they also think I look like a grasshopper to them. Or you can look at the giant and go, man, you know what kind of thing the Lord's going to do to help us overcome them? Do you realize what a miracle the Lord's going to bring about to see us overthrow this people? Because he's already promised us the land. Caleb's going, hey, don't listen to them. God's already said it's ours. Let's go right now. Let's go right now and occupy the land because it's already ours. Listen, church, when we're in the midst of crisis as a people, we have to listen to the prophetic voice that's crying out to say, trust in God's promises. When you're going through crisis in the midst of your life, listen to the prophetic voice that's calling you to the faithfulness of God and what he's promised you in your life. When you have that loved one that keeps going back to the same sin over and over and over again, and you've been praying for them, and you've been crying out with, for them in your heart, and the Lord's made you a promise that, don't worry, I've got them in my hand. Hold on to the promise. Listen for the prophetic voice of those that the Lord will bring in your life to say God's faithful to what he said he's going to do. He's going to do it. Hold on to the promise. Hold on to the promise because the giant you see by faith is nothing more than an obstacle that's going to be overcome. And we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And what is the word of our testimony? That he was faithful. That he was faithful. That's the word of our testimony. He's faithful. So we have to hold on to the voice that's crying out in the midst of the noise that says God is faithful. Hold on to the promise. And church, right now in our culture, in our society, there is a whole lot of noise. We have to wade through that. And sometimes that means turning off the TV. We have to wade through the noise to hear the prophetic voice to say, God has made promises to his people. He's going to be faithful. And cling to that voice. And the nation of Israel here serves as a testimony of what not to do. Of what not to do. It's a warning for us as a people. 
Because the sin that they walked in here was a congregational sin. They made the decision to not focus on the promise, not focus on the blessings that would flow from the promise, but they made a decision to listen to the testimony that there are giants in the land. Numbers 14, this is what it says, Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, Let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. See, church, this is the same group of people that by faith walked through the sea on, as on dry ground. Do you realize that it takes a step of faith when you're standing in front of a sea and you see the walls of water part in front of you? You have to trust that the Lord's going to hold those waters up as you walk through. This is a group of people that took steps of faith to follow the Lord in the midst of the heart of the seas. It's that same group of people that saw those seas collapse back over the armies of Egypt. And now this is the same people that witnessed that, and now they're saying, I don't know if God will come through for us. Let's go back to that place. We saw their army be swallowed up in the sea, but let's go back there now. You see, it's not enough for the Lord for us to walk in faith for a season and then to stop. God is calling us individually and corporately to steps of faith by steps of faith by steps of faith by steps of faith. The call for us to walk by faith is not a one and done. And the Lord is going to ask us in the next season of life together to walk in steps of faith. I believe the Lord is calling this body of believers to hear his voice and obey and trust him. When the Lord says move, I think we're going to be called to take some steps of faith corporately as a body of believers. It will not be enough, church, to walk through the sea and then stop. We will have to continue to hold every promise of the Lord, every single one of them, and we'll have to go all in. I love that testimony, what Josh said, I went all in. Because that's the moment when we're holding back, when we still think we have something that we can add to what the Lord's doing, the Lord will go, okay, just let him go. Let them go. They're going to they're gonna have to find out that I, I don't need their stuff. We're going to have to go all in as a people. We're going to have to take steps of faith together corporately and, and trust the Lord. But that step of faith that he calls us to will lead to another step of faith. And then it will lead to a greater step of faith that we couldn't have walked in six months ago, but now we'll be able to. And then six months later, there'll be another greater step of faith that we couldn't have walked in six months before that. But step by step, we're seeing the promise of God be fulfilled. And it's encouraging our faith in greater and greater measures to get us to the place where there is nothing that can stand before us, not because we trust in our own might or in our own, our own talents or our own abilities, but because we know we serve a God with whom all things are possible. All things are possible with him. We can't witness a God who parts the seas and go, I don't know if he can overthrow some giants. And church, I, I want to give us a word of warning based on what they experienced and based on what I've experienced in my own life. And that word of warning is this. In the days ahead, when the Lord doesn't meet our expectations, we got to keep our mouth shut. It would be better for us to sew our teeth together with wire than to express the frustrations of our heart in the open and give birth to the death when our expectations are not met. Anybody who walks by faith for any matter of time will know that part of the journey of faith is the Lord putting to death the expectations in our heart to make way for the promise of what he said. You see, and we begin to generate, based off what we feel like the Lord said to us, we begin to generate expectations, but the expectation is not the promise. The promise is the promise. And the Lord will deliver on the promise, but I've rarely experienced the Lord deliver on the expectations. And in the days ahead, when we experience the frustration of not experiencing the, the realization of the expectation, we have to keep our mouth shut and not give birth to the death of the expectation in our heart because what happened to the nation of Israel is God gave them what they asked for. 
And sometimes the greatest curse of God on his people is to give them what they're asking for. They said it would have been better if we died in Egypt or, or it would have been better if we died in the wilderness here. Now our, now our kids and our wives are going to be praying. And the Lord said, oh, okay. So I can part the sea for you, but I can't overcome a giant. I tell you what, I'm going to give you what you asked for, and every single one of you are going to die in this wilderness. And those children that you're using as an excuse to not be obedient, they're going to take the land in a, in a generation. The expectation of their heart wasn't met, and they gave birth to the death that existed there. Their lack of faith, they gave birth to it, and it was the curse that remained on their people for a whole generation. And church, I want to tell you this morning that the Lord's not going to meet our expectations, but he's going to deliver on the blessings of his promises. And when those two don't meet, we're going to find ourselves in a season of going, man, Lord, we thought you spoke. We thought you said this. And the Lord said, no, I gave you a promise about this, but I didn't say this that you thought I said, that you made it to be with your own mind. I've experienced this in my own life a few years ago. And, and I want to tell you, my testimony also is in regards to this, is what not to do. Because I can't tell you how many times I don't get it right and follow the Lord. Years ago, I had a dream one night. <clears throat> in a dream, I, I dreamed that we were living in a house that we had bought. And, and I knew the location of the house. It was a very specific location. And the house, in, my, in the dream that I had, the house had this really strange layout and and it was in a very specific place. I woke up in the morning. I told Holly, I said, man, I had this weird dream last night that we bought this house for, in my dream, we bought the house for $40,000, which is a, you know, it's a, it's, it's a lot of money, but for a house, it's not that much. And this was a big house. And there's things tied to it. Like I felt like it would be a place of refuge for people. Who knows what that means, right? But I, 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 so I woke up the next morning. I shared it with Holly. Well, Holly just opens up her phone and she shows me She's had that exact dream two times before. And that's sort of the thing with the Lord. When he, when, he, when he begins to speak to us, he always brings a sense of confirmation. And we have to wait, right? The Lord makes the promise, and then we wait for the Lord to confirm the promise. And he often does it two or three times. Sometimes he does it 10 or 12 times, just to let us know, to make sure we know I spoke and you heard it right. So I was like, man, what, what's the deal? Well, in her dream, her dad bought the house, which I perceived was, well, that's the Lord's going to provide for this house. But in her dream, it was the house was $45,000 and not forty. And I was like, well, that, you know, I don't know what to make of the discrepancy, but, you know, it is what it is. So we'll just kind of see what the Lord begins to do. Well, about a month later, I felt like the Lord said, one day I was praying, I felt like the Lord said, I want you to start looking, looking for houses. So I start looking for houses, and, and I'm just sort, of, just sort of paying attention to what's out there. And sort of hold on to this promise the Lord's made us that we're, we're going to have this house. And, and so we, we start kind of praying. And one night we're laying in bed. And Holly's always kind of done that because she's an interior decorator. She loves looking at what houses are on the market and just seeing what, how they're decorating, things like that. And she just turns the computer over. She says, what do you think about this? It was a house in the location that the Lord had shown me in the dream with this really weird floor plan. But there were details about the house that I had not said about the dream that were in the picture of what I'm looking at. And all of a sudden, I'm like, man, um, like, that, that's like the house. And I said, I've been looking, where, where, where is that? Well, I had put filters, you know, you can put search parameters on what you're looking for. And for whatever reason, I, I had put the search parameter on, and so the house didn't show up because it was more than the price that I had put my filters on, because that's how little faith I have. I mean, I told you guys a story last week. The Lord just gifted us a brand new truck, but I'm putting search parameters on the house that the Lord's going to give us, right? And so I said, man, that, that, like, that looks like the house. And so a couple of days later, we felt like the Lord said, I want you to go pray at that house. I want you to go. You don't have to do it. I just want you to go pray at that house. So we went and prayed at the house, and I felt the Lord said, do you want me to give you this house? And I just said, Lord, if this is the house that you want to give us, we want it. And the Lord said, that's not what I ask you to pray. That's not what I ask you. I ask you, do you want this house? And I was like, well, Lord, you, you kind of initiated this thing. I mean, it's not like I mean, we have a sense of contentment where we are, and we, we understand that where we are is your blessing on us, and we, we didn't have a mind to look elsewhere. And so you sort of put this thing in my heart, and I, I'm just sort of saying, Lord, if this is in your heart, I want it to be in my heart. So, yes, Lord, give, give, us, this, give us this house if this is what you're calling us to. But the house was $400,000. I don't think I missed a zero in my dream. That's a really important zero. You know what I mean? 
And for a guy that doesn't have a job, try to get financing for $400,000. <laughs> it just doesn't happen, you know what I mean? And so anyway, we just began to pray, Lord, what, what, what do you want us to do? And so I, the Lord said, call the real estate agent and go out and view the property. So we went out and viewed the property. And the real estate agent's like, so you guys are wanting to sell a house and then buy this one? And I'm like, I told the real estate agent, I said, look, I hope I'm not being weird here, but I had a dream that we bought a house that looked a lot like this. So we're just sort of exploring what the Lord wants to do. She's like, she gave me what I call the Baptist look. Y'all ever experienced that? And I grew up Baptist, so I know the look really well. It's when somebody says something that doesn't fit in the box, and you're like, oh, one of those people. Um, so she gave me that look, and I said, look, well, I don't know what the Lord's doing. We're just sort of exploring. So we began to set our affections toward that house and toward the moment that we were in, and two months later, that house sold. And I was thrown into a moment where I'm going, Lord, this doesn't match the expectation that I'm a heart of what you promised me. Because you said this house was mine, and I don't know if you know, somebody else is living in it. And I made a statement the next morning. We have, we have a prayer time, a worship time as our family every morning and every evening. And the next morning, Holly, it's kind of like time where we should have been worshiping together. And Holly comes to me and she says, hey, we about ready to like pray and sing? And I birthed out of the death of that expectation, I birthed that into her heart. I said, what's the point? For the Lord to give us something else to chase our tails around? The Lord would have been justified to say, your children will inhabit that house, but you won't see it. But the Lord was extremely gracious to me. But what I didn't know in the moment is that I had spoken death to put a chain around my wife's heart. And church, I want you to know, fathers, I want you to know that the words that you speak in your household have meaning and they have purpose. And when you speak out of death instead of out of life, you do something in your children, your wife's heart, that does irreparable damage. And I found myself six months later praying because my wife's struggling. She's seeking the Lord day and day. She's not getting anything. And I'm like, I, I, go, I, I feel a burden to go pray for her. And I'm like, Lord, what do you want to say to me about what's going on with Holly? And the Lord says, you put a chain around her heart by the words that you spoke out of your own death. And she can't hear from me because of what you've said. Ooh. Dads, guard your lips church, let's guard our lips so that in the moment of frustration, we don't speak death instead of life. Let us at every moment hold on to the promise. I thank the Lord that a few weeks after that, the Lord reminded us the promise still stands. It hasn't been yet, but the promise still stands. We had a friend of ours from South Africa email Holly, hey, look, I just had a dream and you guys were showing us around this new house that, you, that the Lord had given you and you were dancing and you were so excited about it. You were pointing to it. A few months after that, I was in Singapore, and a brother said, hey, man, can I pray for you? And he laid his hands on me, and this is all he said. Dude, I don't know what this means, but I just see a house. And it was like the Lord saying, the promise is still there. Keep trusting. I told you, I'm going to bring it about. Hold on. You think it's a giant that somebody else is living in that house right now? <laughs> That's nothing but an obstacle I'm going to overcome. Hold on to the promise. Keep walking by faith. Hold on to the promise. Not your expectation of the promise. Not what you think the Lord's going to do. Hold on to what he said he was going to do and live by faith. And church, in the next season, for us as a people, we have to hold on to the promise. Not our expectation. Not our hope. Not what we think is going to happen. But what has the Lord said? And let us pursue and let us hold and let us have faith in those moments. In your own life, when the crisis comes, hold on to the promise. When you're in the midst of the sea and the sail's not moving and the Lord said we're going to the other side, but the storm's coming and water's dashing over the edge of the boat, hold on to the promise. We're going together to the other side. We're going together to the other side, not by our might, not by our intelligence, not by our talent, our abilities, our giftings, but by the word of the Lord by the promises that issue out of his mouth and from his heart. And if by chance we find ourselves frustrated when expectations aren't met, let's just be quiet and keep holding on to the promise. Keep holding on to the promise. 
Because no matter what happens, the one who made the promise is faithful. You may be here this morning, you're like, dude, I'm so lost, I don't even know what you're talking about, the Lord speaking, the Lord, whatever, like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm here to tell you that there's been a promise made for you that you can have eternal life through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus. And that promise stands for you, and it doesn't matter what you walk through, that promise still stands. And there's an opportunity for you to walk by faith in that promise. Let me pray for us.